Schizoaffective disorder is a mental disorder characterized by abnormal thought processes and an unstable mood. The diagnosis is made when the person has symptoms of both schizophrenia usual psychosis and a mood disorder, either bipolar disorder or depression, but does not meet the diagnostic criteria for schizophrenia or a mood disorder individually. The main criterion for the schizoaffective disorder diagnosis is the presence of psychotic symptoms for at least two weeks without any mood symptoms present. Schizoaffective disorder can often be misdiagnosed when the correct diagnosis may be psychotic depression, psychotic bipolar disorder, schizophreniform disorder, or schizophrenia. It is imperative for providers to accurately diagnose patients, as treatment and prognosis differ greatly for each of these diagnoses. There are two types of schizoaffective disorder, the bipolar type, which is distinguished by symptoms of mania, hypomania, or mixed episode, and the depressive type, which is distinguished by symptoms of depression only. Common symptoms of the disorder include hallucinations, delusions, and disorganized speech and thinking. Auditory hallucinations, or hearing voices, are most common. The onset of symptoms usually begins in young adulthood. Genetics researched in the field of genomics, problems with neural circuits, chronic early, and chronic or short-term current environmental stress appear to be important causal factors. No single isolated organic cause has been found, but extensive evidence exists for abnormalities in the metabolism of tetrahydrobiopterin BH4, dopamine, and glutamic acid in people with schizophrenia, psychotic mood disorders, and schizoaffective disorder. People with schizoaffective disorder are likely to have co-occurring conditions, including anxiety disorders and substance use disorders. The mainstay of current treatment is antipsychotic medication combined with mood stabilizer medication or antidepressant medication or both. There is growing concern by some researchers that antidepressants may increase psychosis, mania, and long-term mood episode cycling in the disorder. When there is the risk to self or others, usually early in treatment, hospitalization may be necessary. Psychiatric rehabilitation, psychotherapy, and vocational rehabilitation are very important for recovery of higher psychosocial function. As a group, people with schizoaffective disorder that were diagnosed using DSM-IV and ICD-10 criteria, which have since been updated, have a better outcome but have variable individual psychosocial functional outcomes compared to people with mood disorders, from worse to the same. Non-primary source needed outcomes for people with DSM-5 diagnosed schizoaffective disorder depend on data from prospective cohort studies, which have not been completed yet. The DSM-5 diagnosis was updated because DSM-IV criteria resulted in overuse of the diagnosis, that is, DSM-IV criteria led to many patients being misdiagnosed with the disorder. DSM-IV prevalence estimates were less than 1% of the population, in the range of 0.5 to 0.8%, newer DSM-5 prevalence estimates are not yet available. Signs and Symptoms Schizoaffective disorder is defined by mood disorder-free psychosis in the context of a long-term psychotic and mood disorder. Psychosis must meet criterion A for schizophrenia which may include delusions, hallucinations, disorganized speech, thinking or behavior and negative symptoms. Both delusions and hallucinations are classic symptoms of psychosis. Delusions are false beliefs that are strongly held despite evidence to the contrary. Beliefs should not be considered delusional if they are in keeping with cultural beliefs. Delusional beliefs may or may not reflect mood symptoms for example, someone experiencing depression may or may not experience delusions of guilt. Hallucinations are disturbances in perception involving any of the five senses, although auditory hallucinations or hearing voices are the most common. A lack of responsiveness or negative symptoms include alogia, lack of spontaneous speech, blunted affect, reduced intensity of outward emotional expression, avolition, loss of motivation, and anhedonia, inability to experience pleasure. Negative symptoms can be more lasting and more debilitating than positive symptoms of psychosis. Mood symptoms are of mania, hypomania, mixed episode, or depression, and tend to be episodic rather than continuous. A mixed episode represents a combination of symptoms of mania and depression at the same time. Symptoms of mania include elevated or irritable mood, grandiosity, inflated self-esteem, agitation, risk-taking behavior, decreased need for sleep, poor concentration, rapid speech, and racing thoughts. 
Symptoms of depression include low mood, apathy, changes in appetite or weight, disturbances in sleep, changes in motor activity, fatigue, guilt or feelings of worthlessness, and suicidal thinking. DSM-5 states that if a patient only experiences psychotic symptoms during a mood episode, their diagnosis is mood disorder with psychotic features and not schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. If the patient experiences psychotic symptoms without mood symptoms for longer than a two-week period, their diagnosis is either schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder. If mood disorder episodes are present for the majority and residual course of the illness and up until the diagnosis, the patient can be diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder. Causes A combination of genetic and environmental factors are believed to play a role in the development of the schizoaffective disorder. Genetic studies do not support the view that schizophrenia, psychotic mood disorders and schizoaffective disorder are distinct etiological entities. But rather the evidence suggests the existence of common inherited vulnerability that increases the risks for all these syndromes. Some susceptibility pathways may be specific for schizophrenia, others for bipolar disorder, and yet other mechanisms and genes may confer risk for mixed schizophrenic and affective or mood disorder psychoses, but there is no support from genetics for the view that these are distinct disorders with distinct etiologies and pathogenesis. Laboratory studies of putative endophenotypes, brain imaging studies, and post-mortem studies shed little additional light on the validity of the schizoaffective disorder diagnosis, as most studies combine subjects with different chronic psychoses in comparison to healthy subjects. According to William T. Carpenter the head of the University of Maryland, Baltimore School of Medicine DSM-5 Psychotic Disorders Workgroup, and others. Viewed broadly then, biological and environmental factors interact with a person's genes in ways that may increase or decrease the risk for developing schizoaffective disorder, exactly how this happens, the biological mechanism, is not yet known. Schizophrenia spectrum disorders, of which schizoaffective disorder is a part, have been increasingly linked to advanced paternal age at the time of conception, a known cause of genetic mutations. The physiology of people diagnosed with schizoaffective disorder appears to be similar, but not identical, to that of those diagnosed with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, however, human neurophysiological function in normal brain and mental disorder syndromes is not fully understood. Substance abuse a clear causal connection between drug use and psychotic spectrum disorders, including schizoaffective disorder, has been difficult to prove. In the specific case of cannabis, marijuana, however, evidence supports a link between the earlier onset of psychotic illness and cannabis use. The more often cannabis is used, particularly in early adolescence, the more likely a person is to develop a psychotic illness, with frequent use being correlated with double the risk of psychosis and schizoaffective disorder. A 2009 Yale review stated that in individuals with an established psychotic disorder, cannabinoids can exacerbate symptoms, trigger relapse, and have negative consequences on the course of the illness. While cannabis use is accepted as a contributory cause of schizoaffective disorder by many, it remains controversial, since not all young people who use cannabis later develop psychosis, but those who do use cannabis have an increased odds ratio of about 3. Certain drugs can imitate symptoms of schizophrenia, which we know has similar symptoms to schizoaffective disorder. This is important to note when including that substance-induced psychosis should be ruled out when diagnosing patients so that patients are not misdiagnosed. Diagnosis. Psychosis as a symptom of a psychiatric disorder is first and foremost a diagnosis of exclusion. So a new onset episode of psychosis cannot be considered to be a symptom of a psychiatric disorder until other relevant and known medical causes of psychosis are excluded, or ruled out. Many clinicians improperly perform, or entirely miss this step, introducing avoidable diagnostic error and misdiagnosis. An initial assessment includes a comprehensive history and physical examination. Although no biological laboratory tests exist which confirm schizoaffective disorder, biological tests should be performed to exclude psychosis associated with or caused by substance use. Medications, toxins or poisons, surgical complications, or other medical illnesses. Since non-medical mental health practitioners are not trained to exclude medical causes of psychosis, people experiencing psychosis should be referred to an emergency department or hospital. 
Delirium should be ruled out, which can be distinguished by visual hallucinations, acute onset and fluctuating level of consciousness, indicating other underlying factors which include medical illnesses. Excluding medical illnesses associated with psychosis is performed by using blood tests to measure. Thyroid stimulating hormone to exclude hypo or hyperthyroidism, basic electrolytes and serum calcium to rule out a metabolic disturbance. Full blood count including ESR to rule out a systemic infection or chronic disease, and serology to exclude syphilis or HIV infection. Other investigations which may be performed include EEG to exclude epilepsy, and an MRI or CT scan of the head to exclude brain lesions. Blood tests are not usually repeated for relapse in people with an established diagnosis of schizoaffective disorder unless there is a specific medical indication. These may include serum BSL if olanzapine has previously been prescribed, thyroid function if lithium has previously been taken to rule out hypothyroidism. Liver function tests if chlorpromazine has been prescribed, CPK levels to exclude neuroleptic malignant syndrome and a urinalysis and serum toxicology screening if substance use is suspected. Assessment and treatment may be done on an outpatient basis, admission to an inpatient facility is considered if there is a risk to self or others. Because psychosis may be precipitated or exacerbated by common classes of psychiatric medications, such as antidepressants. Stimulant medications and sleep medications, prescribed medication-induced psychosis should be ruled out, particularly for first-episode psychosis. This is an essential step to reduce diagnostic error and to evaluate potential medication sources of further patient harm. Regarding prescribed medication sources of patient harm, Yale School of Medicine professor of psychiatry Malcolm B. Bowers, Jr., MD, wrote, self-published source. Illicit drugs aren't the only ones that precipitate psychosis or mania, prescribed drugs can too, and in particular, some psychiatric drugs. We investigated this and found that about 1 in 12 psychotic or manic patients in an inpatient psychiatric facility are there due to antidepressant-induced psychosis or mania. That's unfortunate for the field of psychiatry and disastrous for some of our patients. It is important to be understood here. I want to call attention to the fact that some persons with a family history of even the subtler forms of bipolar disorder or psychosis are more vulnerable than others to the mania or psychosis inducing potential of antidepressants, stimulants and sleeping medications. While I'm not making a blanket statement against these medications, I am urging caution in their use. I believe clinicians should ask patients and their families whether there is a family history of bipolar disorder or psychosis before prescribing these medications. Most patients and their families don't know the answer when they are first asked, so time should be allowed for the patient to ask family or relatives, between the session when asked by the clinician, and a follow-up session. This may increase the weight for a medication slightly, but because some patients are vulnerable, this is a necessary step for the clinician to take. I believe that psychiatry as a field has not emphasized this point sufficiently. As a result, some patients have been harmed by the very treatments that were supposed to help them, or to the disgrace of psychiatry, harmed and then misdiagnosed. Substance-induced psychosis should also be ruled out. Both substance and medication-induced psychosis can be excluded to a high level of certainty while the person is psychotic, typically in an emergency department, using both a broad-spectrum urine toxicology screening, and a full serum toxicology screening of the blood. Some dietary supplements may also induce psychosis or mania, but cannot be ruled out with laboratory tests. So a psychotic person's family, partner, or friends should be asked whether he or she is currently taking any dietary supplements. Common mistakes made when diagnosing psychotic patients include not properly excluding delirium, missing a toxic psychosis by not screening for substances and medications, not appreciating medical abnormalities, not obtaining a medical history and family history. Indiscriminate screening without an organizing framework.